We are beginning uh, our session number nine and last. Uh, first uh, presentation will be from João Ventura. He's an architect and uh, PhD candidate in uh, ISCTE, Lisbon, supported by a uh, FCT grant. The works of his thesis explore teams focused on the dichotomy between emergence and composition in the urban setting. The multivariate analysis of uh, urban morphology, configuration, and use of public, public open space with relevance to the Portuguese mainland urban square. <clears throat> Exploring the potential of computational tools and data mining, and machine learning techniques, it tests their ability to embrace the complexity of those relations and to bridge spatial formal analysis and urban design. The divulgation of his investigation has been carried out through national and international presentations, publications, and workshops. He graduated from the uh, faculty of uh, Porto University in 1998 and exercised since then professional activity on architectural and urban design both in collaboration as individually. Post-graduated in uh, 2013 from the course of advanced studies in digital architecture in uh, ISCTE and uh, the faculty of Porto. He is making presentation on data mining, spatial analysis, and uh, algorithmic design. I will talk about a little bit of the, um, the subjects that we but it, that we talk there, mainly about data mining, but in a very, in a perspective, a very practical, uh, in a very practical perspective way, introducing the concepts, uh, some tools, some methods, and then to illustrate with some exercises. Mainly, it was it was that that we made. Before there there was no, and I assume that uh, the participants know little or nothing about. The data mining, so I, I gave a review on, on the subject and some contextualization. Um, this was just the, the outline of the workshop. When they workshop, there were eight people there, it was nice, very, very, very relaxed uh, ambient. And uh, mainly in the morning, we just introduced to the concepts and tools, and in the afternoon, we, we play a little bit with the. With the uh, with them, no, and the uh, and the uh, in this duality, first data mining and then Python scripting and trying to to connect the two. Um, now that's uh, for the introduction. I just say that uh, I, I start to introduce it and just saying that uh, it becomes such a be this word in the in the in the last time for for some time now. No, since the upscale of the internet and the big data effect and um, and uh, but even in more recent times in a few weeks it becomes uh, in the uh, uh, it was brought to the highlights even for not for the for the better reasons but uh, I was interested to show them what the this was the Cambridge Analytics uh, website. I, I, before the workshop, I went there to, to see it. I never saw it. And it was interesting to see Cambridge commercial and political side by side. Like, uh, it's, it's the same thing. Of course, about the, the, the news uh, brought about the, the relation with uh, Facebook and uh, in the Trump, in the President Trump campaign. And it says it's a data-driven digital campaign. It's a, a something. And the other, at the same, almost in the same time, it was the first uh, mortal accident in a, with a self-driven self car in the United States. And uh, the rage against the machine that it, uh, it worked in the, in the Californians and so on. Uh, but, um, and then just to contextualize, uh, there are a lot of people studying the these effects on, human, on humankind in a serious way. So, we call, for instance, this book of Nick Bostrom of superintelligence, in many they are concerned with the point, with the point in time where where the, the, where machine intelligence will surpass the, the human intellect, and they call it the singularity. And they they pointed out like for uh, 
2045 that will, will be suppressed by the machines. Uh, but now, after this context, I just introduced uh, data mining as a subfield of computer science with, uh, that connects with our other subfields. Uh, also has several names depending on the, on the field and where it's applied. You know? uh, Data mining has a more connotation with business and uh, marketing and so on, <coughs> but the, use the same tools as um, other fields in technology and science. So there is everything around us. <coughs> now, in the in a certain point, uses uh, data mining or machine learning more properly. You know, the, the field of computer of uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence that deals with uh, with learning. You know. So there are several names for data mining, and um, <coughs> and they talk about the special. They're a kind of a special data mining, also. But I think the, a good mathematician would say it's all statistics, and the rest is just for. <laughs> uh, well, data mining in, uh, in itself is a, a, a standard process or procedures that that starts with the definition of the problem. You have to understand it. Uh, identify the required data, the required data, and acquire it. Uh, prepare it in pre-processing. This phase, uh, it's normally about 85 percent of the of the of the work. Um, then model the data. It would be applying machine learning algorithms to model it, and then train and testing. It's uh, they are connected, so to validate your model and then uh, uh, deploy it or use it or present it uh, as. This is a, a standard procedure, and um, and uh, uh, data mining can be understood as the practical application of machine learning. Just to contextualize, I was saying that <coughs> learning it's a it's a field of uh, artificial intelligence, but the, the artificial intelligence has a a lot of uh, of goals. So besides reasoning, uh, learning would be one of them. So we'd be, and this is the part where. Uh, that the mining uh, works with more uh, much uh, an indu induction thing from you know, you're not uh, it's just a, a deduction thing to, to learn from from the bottom or you would say from examples in learning in the machine learning there are two types of learning I would say supervised learning and supervised learning these are uh, when you know what uh, you are trying to classify or when you don't have an idea what you are trying to classify or you are working with unstructured data like images or, or plain text, something like this. <laughs> there are other reinforcement learn learning, but these are the two main issues. Uh, when you are talking about um, learning and machine learning, there are only these two kinds. Uh, or supervised, you know you are classifying or making a good regression, or unsupervised. In this case, if it's unsupervised, you are doing classification or density estimation or something like this, um, or reducing the, the dimensionality. That's, uh, then I, I just introduced some, uh, the difference between classification and regression, and uh, this is just an example for illustrating what is uh, the difference uh, between uh, Modeling as a regression line or modeling as a bound, uh, decision boundary or something like this between to classify and to to make a re regression. You no, know? if your data is continuous or is uh, it's not continuous. No? So and then the the overall main uh, scheme for uh, for machine learning that you have the data normally and you split it in two parts: one for testing, one for uh, training. You make a model on the training part. <coughs> you make prediction on the text part, and uh, the, and you make then the evaluation with the with the levels of the of the data that never entered into the model construction. So it's uh, it's just a generalization of the process. Then the approaches can be a lot of them. There are approaches or algorithms for uh, that uh, several in depending on the case you could use one or another normally you use several uh, several at the same time and then you classify them and you, know, you try to use the the best one and you do it uh, here it was just for illustrating a case of uh, this is uh, latin semantic analysis which would be uh, automatically classifying documents on 
on keywords. Keywords could be could be anything. The documents could be <clears throat> could be in the internet, Twitters or uh, newsletters or something like this, or mails. And uh, the keywords you could give the keywords, or you can extract them automatically for frequencies. Just it's just just to make the a more appealing <laughs> for the participants to know what. That the data mining is much of looking about structure in the data, so you can you need to find. From, but uh, first of all, talking about the data itself, no, just to have an, a big, an introduction, I will not take no, no much time about it. it. Was just to introduce that this is all uh, classified data comes in tables. Uh, there are several rules or labels for each column. Normally, there's a very strict column you call the, the labor or the target that you want to predict. You know, the other columns are the regular, the data, or variables, which we will use to, to the prediction. And, um, and this was just uh, in the way, because I was trying to, this would be to introduce, because uh, in Python, you have other na names for this, and there are several names. And uh, in tr trying to say that we have tables, but we can have uh, multi-dimensional arrays with uh, tables. Normally, this kind of 3D arrays is a lot used to get uh, image sets, for instance. You have image compared, even compressed in a data set. So you have several images, like it was like a slice in the. Uh, and then the problems with that, uh, it's just, it's normally this, all of these kinds of problems with that do in the, with the pre -pre processing phase that takes uh, almost, I don't know, well, 80% of the time is to handle with that because they can, they can come from several places, they have to be shaped and cleaned and, and so on. So you have to deal with a lot of uh, missing data, duplicate, incorrect encoders, wrong data types, reshape the data to your purposes, dealing with outlier, and even trying to reduce the dimension if you have too many of them. Uh, but, uh, but first we have to, to deal with the, the explore the data, so I was trying to explain that after I've introduced you in the hard way, then I say, but, but you have to start with the exploratory data. So you have to do the, the typical analysis of the um, descriptive statistics. No, it's uh, the end of visual data, so it's, so you have to use like the univariate data into analysis where you are uh, you are analyzing each of your columns to to see about the, um, the shape of your data or you have to analyze it uh, by pairs to compare it with one in another no association you need to calculate the association mainly you can calculate the association with your label your target value and and then this is a standard uh, caution, uh, warning that uh, all you are looking for correlation in things, so don't get too enthusiastic about uh, the cause effect of things. There could be uh, third or four factors in the middle of your... So I just introduced you then uh, to other, um, to, to, to other uh, uh, models or, or methods for that I, I use more in my investigation. Here I'm, I'm not presenting it, but it would be to use uh, reducing the dimensionality by PCA and to do some clustering. And with a simple one, that is would be k-means for, and just trying to show them how you, what PCA is, <laughs> how you, is, uh, you can compare it as a, a best fit, introducing a best fit plane or or shaping your data and then uh, reproject it in, uh, in that plane. So you can produce um, a clear vision of your data. Normally, this is very used for uh, plotting your data. And instead of plotting in, in, the, in the space of your features, you plot it in the space of uh, co components that are artificial features produced by this method. It's a standard method. And then you can even use it to clean up and to select the attributes. And uh, clustering, the two main approaches, there are others based on density, so, but the two main are for, uh, something like a top-down approach with, uh, with partitioning, partitioning the space or the bottom-up where every example is going to be joined in the cluster. You know, that it's uh, the main feature for um, 
associating data that you don't know what are the, the what, how they are associated. If there is any structure in the data that don't have, so if you have to choose something, you choose distances, uh, the similarities, and try to pick her groups in the data automatically. This is uh, an automatic thing. Uh, there are several clustering algorithms. No, this is all very visual, but the, the data is abstract. No, it's just there. and uh, and some have some pros and cons. So, and I, I explain a little bit more deeply the k-means algorithm, very used and and uh, it's simple and normally used for big data sets because it's more fast also. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's got a lot of familiarities with the Voronoi diagram. It divides the space in. It's an interactive uh, algorithm that goes finding the, the distance between the, a centroid <laughs> and the mean of the value. So it's a centroid that is trying to, to will, will always uh, displace itself to the mean values of, of, its, of its elements of its cluster. So this will until until a place where he, 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 um, the interaction stops and there is no more movement. You would say like this. Uh, in the end, just Alguma, just just some words about uh, overfitting and uh, and the problems that you deal when you deal with that. And normally, if you have many dimensions, many attributes, when you are analyzing it. At, uh, how many attributes is space? It's exponentially the volume, the volume is exponentially with the number of uh, of dimensions of the uh, values. So, if you have a lot of values, uh, you would need to have uh, more exponentially more examples to to fill the volume. So it's it's difficult. It's not a, sometimes the data gets too sparse, and there are some combinatory explosions and some bias. In the domain, it's the overfitting. So you have to have a general. You, your model shouldn't model all your example. You have to accept uh, some error in the way that you have a generalization. So uh, to explore, we started with some uh, visual visual programming. Uh, rapid miner, it's very used. It's, it's very important. And I, I thought that maybe I had architect uh, students, so they know where I soper and so on. So. This would be a, a nice way to introduce it's, uh, a visual uh, algorithm composer like, uh, that goes with the data flow from left to side uh, to to right, <coughs> and uh, in mainly I was uh, introduced that and because they had a, even a wizard, <laughs> you can do uh, all data mining process in a wizard step by step with five steps. It's powerful. It can, but. Um, even from collecting that, uh, uh, cleaning it, selecting the label, and choosing the models, they he analyzes uh, I think five or six models at the same time. Then you have a score and so on. Um, then you can uh, build the, the algorithm that was behind the, the wizard. So you have a, not a black box, you can then fine tune everything. Uh, but show it also orange, it's a very common, it seems like uh, for kids, but it's very powerful. Uh, and uh, it's all also visual, and it's very interactive. So, but you can deal with the images, text, and uh, rule induction, and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, environment. But we were focused on Python, and uh, it, for me, I am not an expert, I should say. It was uh, an opportunity for me to explore more the Python environment as it becomes a, a very common language across across many scientific fields and uh, especially in the analytics and data science but uh, this was just a, I have no no special uh, support for Python but it's true that it's getting more used and I think it's a nice language for you know, architects or GIS people because because uh, you can learn from, you are applying it in the, in, in the data analysis environment, but uh, you can use it in algorithmic design, then it's, uh, it's very connected, or GIS if you are built, or even in DeepMap, and I show this. Uh, these were the, the main libraries 
the libraries of Python to, to deal with data analysis from, from scientific computing and uh, crashing numbers to getting uh, data from the internet and everything. And, uh, dealing with data frames, with uh, tabular data. Uh, and then the ski learn, the ski learn with, uh, with uh, the machine learning. The, you know. And uh, this is the environment. Normally there's a lot of uh, libraries and they are very interconnected. It's in, uh, so you have normally the best way it's, and uh, there are several packages of Python that bring all the libraries, necessary libraries together. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is an icon that's very used for, uh, data, mi for uh, data mining and data, data analysis. And um, the way is because the, they, they bring all the libraries in the, because configuring a standard Python, it's not that easy. It's uh, a lot of libraries depending on libraries, depending on libraries. Uh, so. And this is the aspect of, uh, we work uh, with, uh, with uh, Anaconda and use a, a specific uh, way of, uh, Coding with Python is uh, the notebook, the Jupyter notebook. It's a very well, it's almost like a, a Word document or a, if you want. But with the cells and, it shall, and cells can have the images, can be plots of the, or uh, live code inside. So you can print it, you can share it. It's a nice uh, way of interactively and uh, to share your uh, investigation. You can go here and put your things. Uh, and, uh, there are some special libraries for dealing with them. There are libraries for everything, but there are a world of libraries for uh, Python, but uh, this for mainly for special analysis and, and uh, geographic uh, information systems. You can uh, deal with shape, uh, shape files and so on and so on. Uh, collect the internet from the open street maps and so on. The examples we, we did some simple examples. I was not so. This is like uh, importing a, a CSV from a from a from a VGA analysis and uh, plotting the the, script, the summary the sum, the statistic summary of the the columns. Uh, then uh, try to make some to plot using the there's a, a very powerful ways of. Uh, Configuring plots uh, any way you want. It's, uh, um, so we have the map of the, the plot of a VGA analysis with the, with the, with the histogram, and so on. you can even put the color bars, and so you can configure it. or do more complex uh, multidimensional analysis with this uh, scatter plot <coughs> table. With, uh, uh, here it was just an exercise showing a little bit more deep how. This why uh, scripting can help us, for instance, to calculate the number of uh, clusters in a, with k-means. This algorithm for clustering, you have to give the number, uh, number of clusters, and that that's a, a good thing. It was supposed to, you don't know uh, think, uh, anything about your data. You can have a feel and experiment. In scripting, you can run a, in a that way produce a lot of models with two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, uh, and then to plot uh, a lead, to plot is uh, what is called, um, I have to read it, it's called the explained variance. Uh, and there is a, a heuristic, uh, something I have to call it, when uh, there is an elbow in that graph, you, you should choose the group corresponding number of clusters there is in, in the bottom of the, this is a, a heuristic to calculate the number of clusters based on uh, 4K means. Other algorithms calculated it for you, but it's uh, not that one. This is, for instance, I didn't show this in the workshop, I should have said, but this is to connect, for instance, from open, open street map directly to your notebook uh, data from open street map, or in here with a black and white and a figure, ground figure, like uh, you can collect it, and this is go to your to your notebook and you can keep on with the uh, with, uh, network analysis, with uh, libraries of network analysis and so on. So, uh, and the, other the other part was to show the power of scripting. So it was two, so uh, one power was to show that uh, scripting and in this case that even inside the grasshopper that I, I thought that many people would use it in, in this, uh, because they were arch architects and they would find this is using a, uh, Clustering in of geometric figures. It's a simple example of clustering geometric figures. 
with k-means, I think. Or oh, here to classify digit and write digits inside the inside of the, the grasshopper environment. So you know, and to plot it. Or do a, a regression from a, with a neural network. There are, comp there are components that try to implement all these libraries that came from Python inside the environment, design environment. So here we have the, only the dots, and this is fitting a, the, the, the surface in, for that dots, giving the shiz y only, only the plane, and he, he finds the, this in a very simple way, is a fitting on, on the surface only. Even you could do scripting there, but you could even do, I should do doing some scripting inside the, inside deep map, because oh, I thought, oh, or they are on the deep map side, or they are in an algorithm design. Uh, so there is a, it was something that uh, I knew and I wanted to explore. So this is very recent, I, I, I never explored it before. But there is a, a simple scripting language for deep map called Solid Script. And uh, you can do several things with it. We normally use that uh, window too. To, to create new fields with a formula or something like this. Or, and, uh, but you can uh, start to put some code if then and some simple functions. It's a very limited, uh, uh, no, it's not a language, a scripting language with uh, three or four functions and so on. But for instance, the, the, you can do an if then to select, for instance, uh, if you are above the, me, the medium, the mean of the of some uh, property or, or below. And you can, this was the part that I was looking for, it's so you can uh, assess to the neighbors on the graph. Uh, DeepMap normally doesn't allow it because it processes all the, all the points and they give you the final. Here you can assess uh, more fine tuning the, the elements you want in the graph that is beneath the, that was created before. No? So you have a graph and you can go querying for these neighbors um, you can go where the superposition of two isovits or something like this. This is, this is just examples. So I don't get a little bit more deeper that would be, this would be plotting the minimum value of connectivity that uh, a neighbor, that you can see. I'm here and I plot in my place the minimum value of connectivity. And some structures appear, I don't make any theory about it, but uh, it seems like uh, some path or something like this. Um, some path will, will be opening because something I didn't uh, really, this is very recent that you could make some opening a little bit because you go from a narrow place to the other and so it seems that the path are highlighted like this way or something like this. Or you can plot them, for instance, in the same way, instead the minimum, the maximum. So you have partitioning the space in the, a kind of ease of this where uh, you are mapping the maximum value of the x of east all, all across the, the, the system. So you, then you can retrieve it, so I don't know, something like this would be the, where are the maximum values of, uh, I think it's connectivity in this case, and, um, and plot it now, because the maximum, the maximum local values. So you can go across the, into it to see where they are. And to see, this is for, for testing, yes, if you make a, a visual step deep, the, they are all, you, it covers all the system because you you, you, are, you are recollecting all the, the places, or you can just uh, isolate a, a site of interest and uh, and work with the, making some kind of connectivity based only on that, not not on the, all the all the graph. It's just to illustrate this. You could isolate it, and then you can use it. it would be something like or do, this is an, an error to like a rainbow is obvious or something. Like that. In the end, just to for uh, for concluding, marks uh, data mining is used in the in the lot of data mining methods. Now they are used in design and mainly even in design and in design and in analysis. So it's more in the analysis, but in design they can be used because so because they have a strong tie to optimization, for example. And to, but all of this you can are part of the. It's become part of the, this kind of uh, of analysis where you can start to get uh, melting data from several places now, mainly social network, social media, 
uh, that using that as scraping uh, to assess a more or less legal way of assessing database uh, databases in the internet where you create crawlers in the internet and you collect the things, geocoding, and to analyze unstructured data and um, management of database, visualization and optimization. Um, and, um, and, and that would be related with scenario creation, so you, you can have some optimization based on constraints, so you can, you can do it. And nothing in the end, it was this, and just to say that this would be a, this subject, this would be a, a way, I think, to the usefulness would be to assess the, the open data, for instance, that is becoming more available. There are a lot of big databases now that become more public. No? And uh, another point that uh, some people uh, involve, uh, a point is that a way of involving the younger generation, the digital natives that born with the internet, this would be to, now they have uh, not mad, but they have information to, 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 to meddle with their hands and they are all the time creating it and to get a more insight of what's going behind the scenes and uh, how, how, that, how your data is being treated. No why uh, in the internet uh, there is an algorithm that can, can recognize our face. So, but uh, how does it do it? It's, it's not nothing of the other world, you can, uh, you can learn it. And, um, and the uh, useful in design would be to also to create richer um, programming for the, for the design, you know, to have more information and do it thing, things that are more meaningful to the user because you can collect these this amounts of that. But there's a lot of problems also because it's not that easy to, to implement. There is a black box effect. Many algorithms are black. You don't know what happens inside them. Normally things like neural networks and so on, it's very difficult to, to understand. So. Um, um, and, uh, and it makes like a, I think it's uh, some risk of making reality go more far away because you have that in the middle and uh, as a potential of the, as a, as a, I'm pointing it as a problem is getting the reality uh, uh, more apart from the designer or the, or the or people in general because you have a, such a thick layer of, of information in the middle. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, thank you. Thank you for your... your Thank you, João. I'm calling now Patricia Alonso. She's a adjunct professor of the Department of Architecture and Urbanism, PhD student in Architecture and Urbanism from the postgraduate program in Architecture and Urbanism in UFPB, currently doing part of her PhD studies at the Spatial Morphology Group at Chalmers in Sweden. Well, the presentation will be on uh, development of permeability measure between private and public space. Um, good afternoon. My name is Patricia Alonso, and my presentation is the development of a permeability measure between private and public space. And the authors are myself from UFPB, Brazil, um, Mieta Berghauser Pond from Chalmers, Sweden, and Luiz Doirado Amorim from UFPE, also Brazil. And the content of this paper uh, is part of my PhD studies on the relation between density, urban form, and urbanity. And so the natural movement theory by Hillier says that the street configuration is the primary generator of pedestrian movement and activities. And many authors agree that high density generates a higher intensity of activities and movement in cities. However, in certain urban contests, like Latin American cities and in the specific 
study case of this paper, Brazilian cities. Uh, this may not be the case. Uh, in that context, sometimes uh, high street centrality and high density, they come with low presence of people in public space. And our hypothesis is that this is caused by the specific way densification takes place. Uh, the present day Brazilian cities, they have a typical verticalization process, mainly for housing, with high rise residential buildings, as you see in these photos, these are in João Pessoa, the, the study case city of this research. Uh, and these buildings, they have semi-underground floor and often also a ground floor for car parking because of the, the mobility policy um, that prioritizes the private uh, transport. Uh, so here in this paper, we analyze two characteristics related to this densif densification type, which seem to contribute to less inviting and less safe streets. First, the bigger size of plots. Uh, these higher buildings, they demand larger plots because of urban law requirements. And for that, several plots, they are joined, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, reducing the number of plots per block. And second, the consequent lower frontage permeability. Uh, there are fewer entrance and blind walls due to these semi-underground floors for car parking. And so there is less interaction between buildings and streets. So we needed a more comprehensive and thorough frontage assessment and then we developed a measure that captures the frontage permeability, both in a qualitative and quantitative term by verifying uh, the frontage visibility and accessibility separately, uh, the presence of setback, its depth and use, and the type of space, referring here to the land use, uh, which there is permeability to. Uh, so we define uh, the frontage permeability as its property to allow interpersonal interactions in both visual and physical ways between the public and the private space delimited by them. Uh, the study looks at the public-private interface uh, from the public space perspective and the permeability measure as I already said, is divided into two variables that are measured separately. The visibility, which is the property of the frontage to allow people to see through it, and the accessibility, its property to allow people to pass through it. And the measures, they, com they combine uh, the degree a quantitative measure of how visually or physically permeable the frontage is, to a qualitative evaluation about the type, I mean the land use, uh, of space there is visibility or access to. So in this table we can see the permeability is divided in visibility, accessibility, and both of them, they have a, a four category scale. So for visibility, we have uh, no visibility and then visibility to empty space and that means vacant plots or residual or underused space and then visibility to private space and finally to public space. And then uh, it is seen that the setback, if there is or no setback. And for accessibility, is the same, uh, no accessibility, no accessibility, sorry, no access. Um, the controlled access to private space, and that is when you have a gate or a door. 
uh, and this private space, uh, they are uh, residential use. Uh, the control access to public space, all other public, semi-public or collective use like retail um, service, etc. And finally, the open access. And again, it's, uh, we check if there is setback or no. Um, the entrance of closed or abandoned buildings and entrance of garage, they are considered of, uh, as no access uh, because it is understood that there is no social interaction in this case. So the data gathering was made by Google Street and Google Earth, the mapping with AutoCAD, the data processing and analysis with GIS software. Um, the visibility values were based on the average height of the eyes of a pedestrian walking on the sidewalk level. And the height limit to open access, which is a barrier with uh, 40 centimeters high, considers the intention of territory demarcation. Of course, you can pass through it. Uh, but we understood that accessibility is not only about being able to pass, but also about permission to pass. Um, the lengths were measured in meters, and each plot's frontage is the sum of the several entities according to the variables values for visibility and accessibility. Uh, the geometric representation uh, is with lines, with attributes, according to that table that I showed you. And the line length is also added like an, as an attribute. And in case of a setback, it's death and it's use. So the length of each permeability category was measured to then develop various indexes to describe the frontage permeability of each plot. So this is the calculation of the main indexes, the visibility one and the accessibility one. So they are based in the total length of the plot frontage. And we also developed some sub-indexes that we found that should be important, like the visibility and accessibility index to public space, and the visibility and accessibility indexes to both public and private space. Uh, and another one is the accessibility index for open access. Uh, the pilot study uh, are selected areas of Manaira district in João Pessoa city, Brazil. Uh, these photos are from this district. Uh, and it is an economic functional centrality because it is a sub-center in the, in the city with housing, retail, and services. It is also a demographic centrality because it has high population density and also a morphological centrality because of its high values of density, integ integration, choice, I mean the syntax uh, measures, and accessible density. This accessible density is measured with the place space tool. Uh, it's a plugin for QGIS that uses syntax analysis for measuring the accessibility through the street to different contents of urban space. For example, density, that's one, the one I use. So based on the natural movement theory, again, we would expect high levels of people movement in this area. However, in the preliminary um, observation, this is not, it, it does not seem to be the case. And here we have a map with the four areas, the testing areas, uh, the areas one and two, I don't know if you can see, um, they are, in the north part, uh, they have the highest values of accessible, accessible density in local radio, 
within the district range. And the areas three and four, uh, they have medium to high values in the same Hadja, Hadja. And they are next to, to malls that act as attractors. So, as the testing areas have high centrality and accessible density uh, in a district that is also a centrality, it was supposed to, uh, to be expected uh, urban vitality. But according to our hypothesis, there are other variables, and they are the plot size and the frontage permeability that may affect this relation between density, centrality, and urban life. And in order to test this, hypo this hypothesis, uh, the permeability measures are related to local density. And I mean the local to, to, to make a difference from the accessible density that is a, a configurational uh, measure. So the local density, uh, it's basically FSI, uh, the floor space index. Uh, plot size, frontage length, and land use. Um, this paper does not relate the morphological data to people present in the streets. This is the next step in the research. And here we have the maps of the four testing areas showing the frontage accessibility. It's not a good image also. And here the frontage visibility in all areas, there are many frontages with low visibility. And the findings uh, with statistics, uh, we cannot say that there is a statistical correlation between visibility and accessibility indexes to the density values. But we found a pattern in the low and medium densities up to FSI 3. Uh, the entire range of visibility and index and accessibility index is present. The entire range of it, we can see there. Uh, at high densities, FSI above three to eight, both indexes remain low. So this pattern is repeated in the indexes comparisons with plot area and frontage length. It's, it also occurs with the visibility and accessibility sub-indexes for public space and for both private and public space. And this repeated pattern confirms the hypothesis, the hypothesis that this high rise, this high rise residential buildings type causes not, cause not only urban densification, but also a decrease in frontage permeability. And there is no statistical correlation between accessibility index and visibility index. That means that these variables do not necessarily come together, which confirms the pertinence of the proposed method in measuring these two variables separately. And we can see also in this chart that both public use plots retail and service, uh, and those with all other use present high and low frontage permeabilities. Also, in plots with other use, the low values predominate. This indicates that the frontage of public use plots are not necessarily more permeable, which is confirmed in these two charts, which relate the number of plots with public use and other use uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the indexes, uh, the visibility one and the accessibility one. So in, in yellow, you, you have the public use and blue, the other use. And there is a strong correlation between the indexes of accessibility and visibility to public space, which indicates that when there is higher vis 
visibility for public space, there is also higher accessibility. But in the indexes of accessibility and visibility to both private and public space, they, when they are together, they have no strong correlation. So when we analyze this together, we can say that in the frontage of residential space, there is a mismatch between accessibility and visibility. The sub-index uh, accessibility for open access is always very low. I didn't show it. Um, it's very low in any graph, so it demonstrates that open access is it's not, it's very uncommon in this area. And the setbacks are mostly used for parking, so they don't contribute to social interactions. And the moderate correlation between density and plot area and between density and frontage length show that there are still many buildings with high FSI, I mean density, in relatively small or medium plots and with low or medium frontage length. So uh, the hypothesis that the verticalization type in focus brings about bigger size plots is not confirmed. Uh, the conclusion, uh, first, uh, measuring the frontage visibility and accessibility separately has proven to be pertinent because these variables do not necessarily go together. And verifying the land use is also relevant because the frontages of public space are not always more permeable. But when they are, they present higher visibility and also higher accessibility, which does not necessarily happen in private space frontage. Uh, so the initial result, uh, sorry, the, the initial results uh, confirm the hypothesis that the increasing densification model in Brazilian cities with high rise residential buildings generates a decrease in the frontage permeability. Although it does not change the plot size and the frontage length in a significant way. Um, and we can say that the dissemination of this building type generates low interaction between streets and plots, since it's often surrounded by blind walls with no visibility and few accesses, especially when they are built side by side. Uh, according to the results, there are also less dense types that have low frontage permeability. Um, and this is about uh, our urban problems. The fear of urban violence, it's, it's very present in our cities. Uh, however, these case commonly have isolated walls, which can be easily modified or demolished to generate higher permeability. But in high-rise buildings, most of the frontage are semi-underground garage walls, as you can see in these photos. Uh, and they are more permanent structures and more difficult to modify. So this is a bigger problem. And it's important to stress the role of urban planning and management in controlling this, the, this lack of frontage permeability. Uh, the urban law should define minimum percentage of frontage permeability and stimulate the mix of use. And I am finishing. Um, I want to say that these are preliminary results. Uh, this is um, not big data. Uh, it's an ongoing investigation. Other empirical studies need to be carried out for more complete and representative data. And the next steps of the research are expanding the testing areas and relating the morphological data to people presence in the streets. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Well, last but not least, I will go with the Canada Silva. Um, 
Well, she's a PhD professor in the University of London, of Lisbon, sorry. Um, and the main uh, topic of the work is on uh, learning spaces. Uh, her presentation will be on uh, the centrality of vocation-oriented knowledge and assessment of the location of polytechnic institutes in Portugal. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll try to, to be brief and to deliver a light presentation since we are finishing this wonderful symposium. Uh, as Franklin said, I'm Luisa Canes da Silva and I work with uh, Tres Eitor and Mafalda Tucan at CITUA, the Center for Innovation in Territory, Urbanism and Architecture at Tecnico in Lisbon. And I'm feeling a little bit off topic here because my focus is really on the case study. Because even though we do use formal methods and space syntax concretely, we focus on learning spaces in, in my research group. So we've been working with higher education learning spaces for the past years. And in this case, I'm focusing on polytechnic institutions in Portugal. Because higher education in Portugal, well, worldwide, has changed a lot. And a lot of pressure has been imposed on, on higher education infrastructure. And uh, of course, we have to adapt to so many things, as the massification of higher education, the global changes, and for instance, the implementation of the Bologna process, which was signed about 20 years ago. And still, it feels like our buildings are not able to react to all these changes. So we had a, a highly changed uh, higher education system worldwide, and then we have buildings and infrastructure that are not adjusting at the, the right pace. So of course, we want to analyze these infrastructures and to understand how can we improve them and how can we make better decisions in them and how are they related to better missions or to different missions of higher education, mostly focusing on social aspects and interaction. So if we have a higher education system with a threefold mission based on teaching, research and outreach, in Portugal we have to, dif to differentiate between universities and polytechnics. And even though uh, recent OECD studies have shown that this tendency in some aspects is getting, to, uh, is getting blurred, still one of the main assets of Portuguese higher education system is in fact this binary structure. And polytechnics have been perceived as very successful infrastructures in combining and attending to vocational knowledge. So according to Portuguese law, they are oriented towards the creation, diffusion, and transmission of professional type culture and knowledge, and they should focus on vocational training and professionally oriented technical development. Considering this, then we have to look at the geographical dispersion of knowledge inst institutions in Portugal. And on your left-hand side, you have the map of in universities in Portugal, and we can see a clear tendency towards the location of, of these institutions in the main cities, Lisbon and Porto, and in the coastal area. But then we have polytechnics spread more or less all over the place, and of course they have a huge responsibility in educating the, the more segregated areas, because these places can really be connected to different kinds of population and be a key asset in developing the country. In this case, we are focusing on two of them, especially because we are applying a methodology uh, that analyzes the institutions starting from the city. So we consider the city at its global scale, and then we go deeper into analyzing the institution in order to understand how do these institutions respond to their mission in terms of being open to society, open to the academic community, and providing spaces that can be used for the public in, by the public in general. So we are working with Bragança in the north and Beja in the south because these are the extremes in terms of polytechnic institutes. Also because they have very similar conditions. So 
The cities are more or less the same size. Bragança is two kilome square kilometers larger than Beja, and they have roughly 25,000 inhabitants each. So they are very similar in demographic terms. Um, if we move forward to the axial and segment analysis, then we can see that their structures are, in fact, different. So while Beja has a, a deformed grid system that is grounded on a, on a radial structure, Bragança is much more organic, much more relying on topography, and uh, with the strong influence of a valley that crosses roughly north-south. We can also see the fragmentation in the structure if we analyze the numbers on the axial and segment maps because we have uh, a ratio that of uh, relationship between axial and segment lines that's uh, smaller in Bragança, which is consistent with its uh, shorter lines, and that reinforces the levels of fragmentation that we can perceive. So when we move to the axial analysis and we try to understand the position of the institutions within the structure of the system, the first thing that we can see is that they tend not to be very integrated. So in Beja, the Polytechnic Institute is located to the west of the city. I'm not sure if you can see it from there. And in Bragança, roughly in the geographical center, a little bit south. But the cities present very different structures in terms of syntactic properties. So the, the integration levels in Beja are higher than in Bragança. So the structure of the city is manifesting here. And also the polytechnic has a, a better average value than in Beja than in Bragança. If we analyze its main access, because we think it's a key issue for visibility of the university is the location of the the main axis. Well, again, we are still analyzing integration. In Beja, there is a better, a better response or a better, a better potential to, of the university to, be, to become a destination. Still not very good because in these cases, both precincts belong to the 50% more integrated areas of the city, which is not that good. When we move on to analyze between a centrality, then the results are slightly more encouraged, encouraging. And we can see that in both cases, the precinct of the polytechnic is sort of relying on the, um, on the foreground structure of the city, even though composed mostly by background structure. So it means it behaves more or less like a neighborhood, but grounded on the, on the most prone to be used paths in, the, in these locations within the city. Here, although we can find much better values, so the cities perform better in general, and they, they even fit into the normally considered like the reasonable values defined by Hillier for, for this variable, the angular um, choice. When we get to analyzing the main entrance, then the results are way more encouraging. And this is in fact consistent with some analysis we've done previously with universities worldwide that shows that even though the universities tend to be somehow segregated and private within their, their precincts, they, they usually have some more visibility into, in their main access because that makes them attractors and that makes them part of the urban landscape of the city. So they, they are visible and they get a physical presence within the urban tissue. Uh, then we went a little bit deeper, so we've analyzed the precincts and we chose two specific buildings of each one. Uh, we've analyzed both the agrarian schools of both cases and also the health schools of both cases. And while the agrarian schools are located in campus, the health schools are located off campus in Bragança because they are connected to the health center in the area. In Beja, just by proximity reasons, I think they, they didn't have any more plot available in campus, so the health school was developed a little bit uh, more recently and it was developed outside. And we started by creating a functional analysis that separated the sorts of spaces that we wanted to analyze. So regarding the elective spaces and academic spaces, there is not much differentiation. 
but we've analyzed uh, specifically the places that could be used by the exterior community. So auditoriums, cafes, libraries, uh, information centers, and so on. What we found was that the structure of the building some, somehow responded to the structure of the city. And we have a more fragmented and difficult to read uh, structure in Bregenza than in Beja. Also, the topography doesn't help. And here there is something that might be of importance because in Bregenza, the schools tend to have more connections to the exterior, which of course seems like a good thing when you want to reach the auditorium or the bar or anything. But then you have the power of the key master, so we actually don't know in situ how does this work because this structure can be severely affected by the man that locks the door. So. More or less the same pattern for the health schools. So we have so very deep schools if we consider that they reach uh, seven levels of deepness. So if a student wants to go to a classroom on the last level, it's still a lot of effort to reach. So it's, this is just another organization to simplify things. And it shows that there is at least one very good issue, is that we have a complete mix of uses. So we cannot say that we have classrooms on the, upper, on the easiest level, and then research areas in the top one. It doesn't happen like this. And we have a complete mix of uses. And at all levels, it's possible to find almost all sorts of spaces. So, to conclude, we don't have a lot of conclusions because this is work in progress and, well, of course, I only shown two cases. We have some more, but still not enough to, to have uh, supported this, uh, support, well, to support our, all of our information and our research. So, I would say the most interesting thing is that really universities don't seem to, to have changed according to to the changes in missions that they have had in the, last, in the last decades. And actually, we are still building campuses as we did in the 19th and 20th century in America. So we really should start thinking about how do we want to build for what we want to teach and uh, all the student center processes that we have and also some of the types of learning that we've seen here in this symposium because most of our spaces are really not responding, not even to the social changes that we have. So it's important to consider how do we want to, to teach our students in the future and how do we want our spaces to convey the missions that we are supporting and that we are spreading. So thank you for bearing with me in the last part of the symposium. I appreciate that you are still all here. <laughs> There is a thing I would like to... Oh, please, please. Uh, why some places there are a lot of people and the other ones there are not much? And I was thinking, like, you decided to um, do this research as describing how the spaces are, but uh, what if you try to look for uh, how many places to go there are, or how many places can people come from? Wouldn't this uh, give you a better reading of... Uh, how many people of vitality of a street than just describing if you can or not go there. Uh, we passed, when, on the way here, I passed through a, a few squares that are very beautiful and completely accessible, but it doesn't mean that I'll go to that place. Yeah, yeah to, to, to check this, uh, this vitality that you were searching to describe, right? How many people be on the streets was pretty, pretty much this, what was, you're trying to describe and see if uh, that space could uh, define it. Uh, yeah, what would, would be very important to me, and I don't have this data yet, is to, to, to know uh, the, the people movement, the data about the people movement in the street. Mm -hmm. So I intend to, to go there and to measure it and to try to correlate with this morphological data. Uh, but to see where are they going, well, it, it could be a way, uh, but what I wanted to check, it was the relation between the density and the form of the city and the social process that can occur in the city. So, when I go to the literature, 
uh, we find a lot of, of authors that defend that high density uh, likely will bring um, more people and the syntax also uh, tries to show that more centrality also is important to co-presence. So I, I try to, to find uh, an area with high density, with high centrality, but there are other varieties, vir um, that is the frontage and, and the plot size, and I think that these characters, they, can, they come with the, the type of the building, and they can also interfere, of course they are not <coughs> signed, they do not decide it, but they interfere somehow maybe in, in, in this presence or not presence of people in the street. Uh, as it is central and as it is dense, it is supposed to have people there because it's a centrality, it has housing and it also has uh, retail, so okay, I can I can try to see where are people going, but there are people living there, and these people mm -hmm. they have to to leave their house. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm trying to say is that because there's a bunch of people there, there should be many people in the streets. It's pretty much this. Well, th there is a lot of things that interfere in this, mm -hmm. as I said. For example, uh, uh, the urban problems in Brazil uh, make it people fear the street, so it's very common. Even the houses that are not so dense, they have walls. Um, but what I was trying to find is that with more densification, with these high buildings, uh, this lack of um, permeability is it getting worse and my data it's still a little data but uh, it already shows that the more dense uh, we have more lack of permeability and of course it, it, it interferes in the way people feel in, in the street uh, I don't know if I não, tudo bem. Ok, a gente conversa depois melhor. <laughs> More questions? Patricia, I have a quick question. Uh, do you think you are going to research the typology, uh, the variations of typologies according to your variables? Say, certain types of building uh, make the situation worse for co-presence and certain improve it or I mean within the this range if you are going to try to find sort of differentiation yes uh, and uh, the first thing is the density when I have a higher density um, usually it comes with verticalization it's it's a process that occurs there um, the densification is by verticalization and this kind of verticalization with these high buildings for 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 houses uh, they they have a very clear type of this uh, this base that makes this wall uh, and when you have when you have um, not so high buildings. It's a, an, another type that sometimes is more permeable, permeable, permeable. Um, but the thing is that in all area, it's very common to find lack of permeability. Mm -hmm. They think that's why the the, the graphics they, they are not so clear because there is no correlation. Because when you go to low densities, they also show lack of permeability, but not always. 
so you have uh, it's spread. But when you go to the high density, it's always low density. So it's very clear that uh, the type is showing this uh, relation. I, I don't want to say correlation in a statistic way, it would be wrong, but they are connected. Uh, also for you, Patricia. Um, I, I mean, I think you know, the study is very interesting because it shows how um, different uh, places in the world have, you know, because of their different setting and their different um, organization, that uh, a measure that is developed at one place may not necessarily apply to another. And um, looking to um, the situation in Singapore, I think your um, study uh, seems quite relevant because um, we also have a lot of residential, I mean, most residential, uh, most housing is high rise or relatively um, high rise, but there are two very distinct types. One is um, public housing which is, um, does not have any wall around it, which is completely open, and even has um, the uh, ground floor completely open through void decks. So you don't only have the perme permeability, but you actually also have uh, porosity. And then um, the um, private um, housing, which also has all these walls around it. And um, I mean, of course, there's still differences, but um, you know, just reflecting on that, it's 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 quite obvious, of course, how one um, has a lot more potential, and and you also see a lot more people uh, walking around than in the other situation. Something Patricia said um, touched my heart. Three three words: hypothesis not confirmed. I know João Ventura, we uh, talk a lot about his work, and he says in our discussions that he has not, uh, in his work of several years, he has not arrived to great conclusions. <laughs> well, this modesty and dishonesty is absolutely, absolutely marvelous. <laughs> in our works, in uh, all your uh, presentations there are uh, honesty and, uh, uh, and modesty. And this is uh, really marvelous. We can compare with some other speeches on architecture when, uh, well, there are uh, clear sentences that uh, uh, sets the truth. And they are norms, they are normativity. And I, I have nothing against normativity, but I, I have when normativity tries to be the truth. That I cannot uh, allow. <clears throat> and I think this approach we have, the use of formal methods, is one of the, way, of the ways we have to, uh, to affirm this uh, modesty and uh, uh, and dishonesty, because it's very difficult to to deny the the, the facts we uh, we uh, collect and the, the methods that are explicit. They cannot be uh, they cannot be falsified. Well, I think it was. <laughs> It was this I, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to say. <clears throat> and thank you. We are ending now. And we are uh, uh, going to, well, to where? <laughs> OK. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat>
of you for your combined efforts. It has been a great honor for us to spend these past four days with you. With your activity participation, the symposium successfully completed all of its goals. This was the most rewarding thing to witness. The primary goal of the symposium was to bring together researchers from all the world who would be able to engage in a likely and intellectually open dialogue, discussing the issues, facing architectural formal methods, making constructive contributions towards strengthening our research practices and approaches, helping to promote interdisciplinary exchanges and to explore new research questions. We decided to begin with a model adopted in previous formal methods symposia and use this to create a new and exciting meeting, combining contents of quality and adding some stimulating activities such as workshops or social happenings. We also discard the possibility of parallel sessions to ensure the cross-fertilization of the various scientific fields. We knew it will reduce the number of possible papers accepted and the quantity of communications presented, but the sponsors agree with it and support this decision. After all, we don't seek quantity but quality, so we are totally convinced that we took the right option. Obviously, we can improve the way we did things and get better in the future. Apart from the keynote sessions, the most powerful impression that we have formed over these days has been related to the quantity of the papers presented, the quality of the papers presented, and the debates that they gave rise to, providing us with the opportunity to scrutinize both the state of the heart and the state of the practice in the architectural formal methods umbrella field to present advanced experiences, exchange of ideas and measure practices, and propose many construction ideas and suggestions for improving architectural formal methods from a theoretical and a methodological point of view, to discuss some of the challenges facing architectural formal methods today. So, RFM. Some concrete ideas emerged and many new connections uh, we made that we are sure will have a pos positive impact in this field. We believe that the closing of the symposium will not be an end, but a new starting point. What comes next? Okay, we can maintain professional or and personal contact between us. We can invite each other for future meetings, lessons, workshops, or combine and merge expertise to provide mutual and complementary service to society. We can even build a platform for international co cooperation in SCABA. This is a new brand, a new uh, acronym that we invented, space configuration, acidity, and visibility analysis that cover a large spectrum of our work. So, built a multipolar network to communicate between us and with the society, to discuss and support people and organizations who are designing the future of the cities and the environment. The OPOARC project team is now implementing a closer at Porto that can, that can be linked to others around the world. Before I formally close the symposium, please allow me, on behalf of the organizing committee, to express again our sincere gratitude for the support of Opor to Work Formal Matters Project Team in making possible for us to host this symposium and for the participation of all those involved. I should like to thank to, this, to, thank to the institutions that support this symposium, the CESAP, Cooperativa de Ensino Superior Artística do Porto, CRL, to ESAP, Escola Superior Artística do Porto, and its Master Program in, in Architecture for the Institutional Support. The North Wind Wind Program and OPOARC Formal Methods Project Team, which allowed to fit in, your, in our activities the support of the European Regional the Development Fund from the European Union. I should also like to extend a further word of thanks to the various people who helped to make this symposium a success. I make an account, I, and uh, I suppose more than 300 people are involved in this, okay? Not only the people that are here, but all the people that committed something to this symposium. So I should like to extend to uh, the group of keynote speakers, of course. It was an honor for us all to be able to listen, uh, to discuss your ideas. We link it remotely to Rio de Janeiro also. I would like to the group of volunteer chairs who conduce the paper sessions. Uh, fortunately, uh, you had the gong power. You and me had the gong power, okay? To shut down discussions uh, due, to, due to time constraints. Uh, as you know, in Portugal, we 
are ferocious with uh, delays. We cannot support delays at all. Um, I want to thank to the dedicated staff of meeting desk and the support team. I just want to let you know, support team and staff here, that having you in your team made all the difference. Next time, I will make t-shirts, okay, and give you a t-shirt that says, I'm outstanding, beautiful. <laughs> to the members of the Scientific Commission for their effort, availability, and commitment, they will continue to work on proofreading articles for publication. No, of course, you will work a little more. Work not stop yet. To all my colleagues of the organizing committee, with special thanks for Professor Franklin Moraes, Catarina Ruivo, e Cristina Paixão, without whom it will be impossible to carry out this task. Also to David Leite Viana and Isabel Cristina Carvalho for their continuous effort of, and contacts with several institutions and personalities. Uh, David uh, can fill my mail with an average of 135 mails per day, more or less. Um, to have been with me working at the forefront over the last years. I know things have been a mess sometimes and the rush hours were tough, but you did a great job. I know Professor Franklin's list of tasks to perform are increasing week by week. Nowadays, the list have more items to do AACP than in the beginning. And the symposium is at the end. So I will need more nine months to complete all. To all of you, for your patience with uh, all the various inconveniences that may have been caused by our less than efficient organization of the event. And finally, I will thank, of course, because he, we try to think about everything, but he will give the best, but sometimes the things don't uh, occur well. So, an event such as the symposium, which brings together people from so many different parts of the world, demands a great deal of organization, planning, and time consumption. I feel, as I am sure uh, the others do, that these efforts have been rewarded by some of the most creative and thought-provoking sessions we have held so far. And everyone connected with academic formal methodologies are very grateful for that. I know, of course, that symposium happy hours are uh, shortly. I know that. Sorry. Must, must be. I hope, after all, these four international symposium from our methods in architecture held at Porto in 2018 will leave a memorable and lasting impression of all of you. Um, now it's time to mingling once more, okay? I hope to see you uh, in the conference dinner. Thank you so much for making this sports symposium possible and for making it so truly memorable. This four international symposium for methods in architecture is now formally closed. Thank you. <laughs>